Yeah, so the university, Technical University Wuppertal in Germany, um, and uh, Lund University and the University of Amsterdam, we are combining forces to create a two-year master's program on cycling. Uh, and so each of the universities sort of brings its own strength. The AIM is our first cohort to be, uh, to be up and running um, as of 2023. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Dr. Meredith Glazer with the University of Amsterdam and director of the Urban Cycling Institute. As you just got a taste, she has some exciting new graduate program information to share with us. And, you know, we also talk a little bit about what it's like living in the Netherlands as an expat and a parent. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Meredith Glazer. This is John with the Active Towns Initiative and the Active Towns Podcast, and I'm so delighted to have Meredith Glazer back on the podcast. Meredith, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, you could actually even call me... Dr. Meredith Glazer now. Yes, which is exactly. really exciting. Yes, congratulations. Yeah, you defended <laughs> your your dissertation yes, and all of that good I stuff. Defended. That, that's yeah, fantastic. So why don't we do this? Uh, for the audience that may not know you yet, uh, why yeah. don't you just give a real brief overview of uh, who you are and what you're doing and where you are? Okay. Um, well, I'll do it in a nutshell because otherwise it would take the whole entire podcast. <laughs> yeah, none of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I'm Meredith Glazer. I'm currently the, the director of the Urban Cycling Institute at the University of Amsterdam um, and now a postdoctoral uh, researcher and lecturer uh, in the Department of Urban Planning. Um, and as you can probably tell, I, yes, I am American, um, born and raised in California for the most part. And uh, but I've been based in, in the Netherlands since about 2010. Um, and, um, yeah, my background is in urban planning and in public health. And, um, when I sort of finally found, you know, bicycle and pedestrian transportation planning, I thought that this, that that represented just a really great intersection between the two fields that I was studying, which was public health and urban planning. Um, and it sort of, you know, combines these, these two disciplines in such a great way. And I moved to the Netherlands um, in 2010, um, and uh, found myself in this, you know, this, in this very sort of niche uh, industry of um, bringing um, professionals, uh, city builders, um, engineers, policymakers, planners, bringing these individuals to the Netherlands to sort of learn about um, bicycling policy and. Um, and, and also other just sustainability practices um, that the Netherlands has has become uh, sort of a, a beacon uh, in the world of uh, best practices related to these fields. Yeah, 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 fantastic. And I'm going to pull up uh, the uh, the iPad here version. Uh, so I mentioned welcome back because you were on the podcast before. You yes. were in season one. We're in season three now and episode 47. And so for, for folks that may not have listened to that episode, hey, please uh, go back and lo listen to that. We go more deeply into sort of your journey of getting to the Netherlands and, and all that good yeah. stuff. So uh, it, it's one of my favorite uh, episodes out there for from that season one period. And, and here's a few photos uh, from my last trip to, to the Netherlands, which was uh, in 2019. And you were a big part of that trip because we were sort of hanging out together for at least the first week. And actually we a little bit the second week too, when, I, when we got back from Copenhagen, uh, I saw you yes. in Delft as well for, for yet another yes. study tour. And yeah. a big part of, of what you were doing and the reason why you were part of that study tour was you were sort of studying that a little bit. And we, we talk a lot yeah. about that in the first episode, but just as a, a quick little sketch of that, because yeah. you just mentioned it a little bit of, of the, yeah. the Netherlands being a little bit of a learning platform for, for, for folks globally. Talk a little bit more yeah. about that. Yeah. So, um, the study visits was my, my main uh, case studies that I used to explore um, not only how ideas move from one place to another, but how um, the, the people who are practicing urban and transportation planning 
how they learn about these ideas and then what they do uh, with that new knowledge. Um, so, of course, you know, the way that ideas move from one place to another, that's that's not a new concept. It's been around for, for centuries. But um, this idea really gained a lot of traction in the 80s when um, policy studies scholars repackaged the concept as something called policy transfer. And policy transfer is a really popular idea, uh, especially in governments, you know, to save time and money. Uh, governments don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can just borrow from other cities' uh, success stories. And these are often called best practices. Um, so officials and planners, you know, they travel the globe and they want to validate these best practices. They want to see them, experience them. Um, and in real life to see how sort of palatable they are or how they could, you know, potentially transfer or borrow these ideas. Um, but actually, there's really very little evidence that policy transfer actually happens in practice because every city is unique. Uh, even though the solutions might be the same, uh, you know, cities have different forms of governance. They have different rules, regulations, different stakeholders. Uh, and so my research investigates how uh, or my dissertation research rather investigates how uh, these very local actors, how they can, you know, expose new pathways of learning processes involved in policy transfer. Yeah. So I, yeah. I studied these these study visits yeah. uh, as as cases to to sort of learn about uh, how people in practice uh, uh, learn about best practices relating to cycling. Fantastic, yeah. And, you know, it's, I, I'm able to see it from a, a couple of different sides. I'm able to see it as somebody yeah. who is like uh, filming that and having a, you know, trying to capture yeah. the, the, not only the, you know, the what of what was happening, but also some of the emotions and, and what that, exactly. that sort of aha moments that were happening there. But then I also have the uh, ability to see, um, you know, sort of, just by chance in some ways, um, the result of, you know, over a decade worth of learning, uh, you know, here in the yeah. living laboratory, which is Austin, Texas, because Austin yeah. has that history of, uh, learning from the Dutch, you know, dating back over a decade, uh, with the very first think bike workshop that took place here. And then even, you know, more recently, some of these more recent, uh, ventures, you know, to, to be able to learn from that environment. So it's been really neat to see, yeah. um, that impact that is happening and having, to, and being able to see not just, not just some, some adjustments in policy, but also seeing concrete stuff literally go down on the ground in terms of infrastructure. So it's, it's super, super cool. Now you had mentioned that you're now the director of the Urban Cycling Institute, which is, you know, right yeah. here on screen. Uh, yes. Talk a little bit about, you know, what this is all about, because this yeah. is, I, I, I think it's all sort of related to what you were just talking about. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. So, um, the Urban Cycling Institute, we were founded in 2015 um, by uh, Professor Marco de Bromelstrut, who's uh, very well known on Twitter as the Feeds Professor, the Bicycle Professor. Um, and uh, we've been a small sort of interdisciplinary team of researchers at the University of Amsterdam uh, who use the bicycle as a lens to explore urban challenges, uh, whether they're, you know, gentrification, or policy transfer, um, but also, you know, media studies um, or um, uh, childhood health, um, uh, cycling innovations, um, all different types of challenges that, um, that our cities are facing. Um, and Marco Tabromostrut uh, still continues to be the academic director. And, um, and in, when I finished my PhD, I took over more leadership role on, on our programming. Um, so we do a lot of education, um, of course, but, uh, but on different levels. For example, um, professional development, um, master classes, and, and sort of, you know, these leadership development um, uh, seminars and trainings, uh, but also research. Uh, so we're still involved with uh, a very large European uh, project called Civitas Handshake, 
which which is a large, complex project with 13 cities who are all learning from each other around cycling and transferring knowledge from one place to another. Um, but we also have an ambition to uh, to train, you know, the next generation of transportation planners and uh, and urban planners with the idea that uh, you know sustainable mobility. Uh, has to include cycling and that our our streets, our urban streets, which is arguably the largest asset in any city, uh, must be transformed uh, in a transformative way uh, to accommodate uh, these types of, uh, you know, an upscaling of cycling in cities. Yeah. Not only for cycling, but for other types of modes as well, for public transit, for uh, for all types of two and three wheel devices that are now, you know, you're seeing this surge on the market um, in, in different technologies and innovations. And yet our streets are, you know, the uh, the innovation that is left behind. Right. right. The, the streets cannot keep up with all these demands being placed on them. Yeah. Yeah. So I see a couple of other uh, projects here. So it looks like uh, Transfer and yeah. Cycle Walk also. What are those two programs? Yeah, Cycle Walk uh, just ended in December. Uh, it's all, it was another European project uh, with, uh, with the regional program called Interreg. Uh, which focuses on smaller regions that are not necessarily, you know, the large urban uh, urban areas. So we were looking, we were in uh, six different regions uh, in in Europe, and uh, that project was focused on um, on transferring knowledge of um, of sort of um, how do you say it, like the the qualitative aspects of cycling infrastructure and also walking sidewalks and bike paths. But how do you improve public space, um, you know, in a qualitative way to enhance uh, the experience? And then how do you translate that into standards and regulations? Uh, So we developed a set of of, uh, quality indicators for a cycling and walking infrastructure that not only have to do with the public space itself, but also how governments can innovate to allow for these types of new regulations to, to happen in their communities. You, you said something there that made my ears perk up, you know, as a, uh, a health promotion professional and, and public health guy from way back when and behavior modification, you know, that qualitative aspect of the built yeah. environment and the infrastructure has always been something that I've gravitated towards because, it, you know, it, it's not just a matter of, quote unquote, cordoning off space for people. You have to make it truly uh, a space that feels safe and inviting and the qualitative aspect of it is so important. So is, is that sort of what you're talking about in this in Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we did a lot of uh, sort of public space uh, analysis and used different toolkits and questionnaires to, uh, to have the stakeholders involved in the project um, uh, analyze public spaces and, and also the cycling infrastructure. And so it was a, it was a really wonderful consortium. Um, we had, um, a, a region in Romania, we had Vilnius, uh, Lithuania, um, Bergenland, which is outside of Vienna, Austria. We had the region of Sardinia, which oh, cool. was a lovely place to visit. <laughs> um, well, and one, of, and one and, of the area, one of the blue zones. I mean, that's that's one of the and, areas yeah, of exactly. the world that has some of the the longest living uh, adults. So good stuff. And yes. then what's transfer? Yeah. Transfer was uh, the extension of my dissertation, which focused uh-huh. on Austin and New Orleans on um, on the Final Mile project. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, well, thanks yes. so much for, for, for walking through that and congratulations yeah. once again on, uh, you know, finishing that dissertation off and, uh, yes. having that PhD taken care of and then taking, oh, uh, yes. taking control, taking over the, 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 the control of the, the Institute there. And it's, it's doing yeah. such great work. I want to pause and shift just a little bit to, to yeah. talk a little bit about w- what it was like. We, we, we dive into this more, more deeply in the first episode, but, I pulled up some some neat footage that we can have some fun with because, you know, you were this, you know, 
California girl sort of dropped into uh, the the <laughs> Dutch environment. But then, uh, then you also became parents too. So I want to yeah. play. I want to play this this uh, first video here because it, it talks a little bit about something that I think parents worldwide. Uh, can relate to and, and, and deal with. So let's, let's, uh, let's press go on this and, and see what this is like. The mobility environment is so tied to that for, for us as a family, yeah. because we don't have a car. So you know, we travel all by bike and everything is so close together. So, you know, I bike three minutes to drop off my kid at school. Yeah. Three minutes. Even at rush hour, it's three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it might be a little more crowded. Yeah, sure. But it's still three minutes. So I can't imagine, you know, what it takes to, to, to drop your kid off at school in an environment where you, you're you forced to schlep everything in a car, you know, find a parking spot. It just takes so much time. <laughs> Do you remember that now? <laughs> Um, it's vague. It's vague. Uh, I was looking at the surroundings thinking, where is that? Yeah. So that was one morning when, when Zach, Zach Vanderkoy, who was also part uh-huh. of that, uh, that particular, uh, group that, that we were mm-hmm. there with, um, he was taking us for a ride. And so you and I were just kind of tagging along. We were sort of in the back, just kind of talking. I think we were literally the caboose. I think we were, you know, kind of <laughs> hanging back a little bit just to make sure nobody got lost. But that was like a, a really relaxing morning ride towards the end, just to check out some uh, some nice places and some, and some more recreational uh, facilities. In fact, you and I carried on a discussion about uh, some activity assets and, and all of that. But the reason why I like that little clip, is, again, is because it resonates, I think, so uh, profoundly with, uh, especially here in North America, but also globally with that challenge of, you know, getting kids to and from school. So two years later yeah. and COVID <laughs> thrown in, uh, how, how's yeah. that going? I mean, it, has, it, has it profoundly changed at all during the pandemic? And, 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 and where are things at now? Um, with related to, you know, children's mobility in general or my well, personal family? More, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about ch- children's freedom and, and mobility yeah. in just a moment. I was thinking more just that, that run of to and from school. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, the pandemic changed that in, you know, in that we were home all the time. Um, and you know, in lockdown measures, uh, yeah, we really, we, we really miss that commute, actually, um, and taking our kids uh, kids to school and to and to daycare. Um, but once so once you know school was back in session and daycares open again, um, you know, I, yeah, we didn't see uh, we didn't see a huge a huge change or a huge shift uh, in our own family behaviors. We're still um, taking children to to school, and and once in a while, my older daughter, who's seven and a half. Uh, she, you know, will ride her, ride her own bike to school, which again is a very short bike ride and, uh, and, and great to give her that experience, you know, on the street, um, because hopefully in, I would imagine less than a year, she might be able to be doing it herself, which is so freeing to think about as a parent. And also, of course, a little bit scary (laughs) thinking about, uh, you know, giving also allowing for that freedom. Well, and the second clip that I want to show is 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 a little bit of that, because then you later on uh, during our ride, we were we were talking about this really cool um, adult playground structure that used to be in place in Vondel Park. And uh, and so I was I was asking you if, if you had visited it before and, and you said, yeah, sometimes I even bring the kids over to this and kind of turn them loose and let them have, have fun. And you and I were kind of riffing a little bit on the fact that uh, for adults, um, it's very unusual to see that sense of play being done oh, yeah. into public, into, into the public realm. And so we were talking a little bit about that side of things, but then, uh, then you took control of, of, you just kind of went with another direction and you were like, 
And, you know, and, and, and so this is really cool. I'll, I'll press play on this and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this afterwards. I take my daughter there, uh, usually with another kid, um, and I just let them run wild. Yeah. Um, and they come back with all types of stuff they find in the little forest there. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's one side of the Dutch I think I, I find really charming is that they will one, let their children run free. Yeah. Um, but it's also just sort of free range mentality of exploration and creativity. Right. Uh, is, is, a, is a really nice, yeah, it's a nice cultural feature. Right. Of, um, of that transcends into adulthood as well. That, yeah. You know, they, they find traveling, you know, you find Dutch people all over the world because they really value getting out and seeing other cultures, living elsewhere. Um, I was talking to an older parent who has a couple of teenagers and they just let their teenage daughters go on an overnight adventure to Utrecht. Cool. So yeah. from Amsterdam, they, they got a back, you know, took a backpack, they got on a train and they went and stayed at a hostel in Utrecht for the night um, by themselves. Awesome. <laughs> and it's great, you yeah. know, it's, they know that it's safe, they can take the train, yeah. um, they know it's another Dutch city, so they sort of, they couched it in this idea of like, okay, well eventually they're gonna wanna go internationally and take trips together, so let's let's do a first couple rounds of these, these starter, you know, beginner's guide to, uh, to international travel. Um, which I thought was so sweet. I can't imagine in the future doing that with my kids. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I do remember that. Yeah, I think we were in the Amsterdam of Bos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that, uh, at that period. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do remember that was our, our neighbors who sent their, their two daughters off. That was so sweet. <laughs> So uh, talk a little bit about that, though, you know, because I think that there's there's a connection there between what you are experiencing as parents and uh, and the built environment and that 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 concept of of feeling like, well, yeah, I mean, there isn't that existential threat of being in the public realm when you're a, a child growing up in the Netherlands. And then therefore that helps support this other aspect of uh, reinforcing, uh, being able to have that sense of adventure and doing these other meaningful you know, types of things. Yeah. Just thinking that, you know, just having children in public space Right. Uh, it just adds so much to the vibrancy, right? I was just in Rome for actually for Handshake, uh, the Handshake Project. We had our first gen general assembly after two years of, uh, of COVID restrictions. And I was surprised to see so few children, right. uh, you know, throughout our bike rides, um, through just out our walks uh, during the day, during the, you know, early evening, um, so few children, so few families walking with their children. Um, even, even when I would think it would be, you know, an out of school hours, right? Uh, early dinner, um, Saturdays, even I was there on a Saturday and Sunday and just saw so few children and just kept wondering, are maybe families are leaving Rome or, or where am I missing the public spaces for kids? And that's something that um, I, I really do value about um, the spaces here in, in the Netherlands, which you see packs of children, you know, going through the street. And um, I certainly look forward to that. I mean, we're even, we're experimenting now with um, our older one who, yeah, she's seven and a half and, you know, she can walk around the block by herself or take her, her scooter and, and go around our block by herself, by herself, which, um, is, is immense amount of freedom for, for her. Um, and, you know, pretty soon her sister, who's, uh, who's almost four, you know, she'll, they'll be able to do that together, which, uh, which is great, but, but there's something that is a norm, you know, it's a cultural norm in our city here. And, um, and it's, it's very much appreciated. I think it brings this vibrancy and it also brings a sense of, you know, like the great Jane Jacobs says, you know, eyes on the street. 
and uh, and I have this I have a have a faith in in our uh, community here that um, there's people looking out for her. Of course, we you know there's also some. Uh, uh, there, there are certain cons- certainly consider- considerations that uh, you know we live in a uh, uh, generally you know middle upper class neighborhood. Um, you know, there's uh, there are a lot of safety features. There's lighting. There's uh, you know um, very traffic calm streets. So there's a lot of other sort of physical characteristics and social characteristics that. Uh, that also, uh, you know, allow for this. So it's, um, yeah, definitely something to consider. Yeah. And I love that you channeled, uh, Jane Jacobs because, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> you've got a Jane Jacobs quote right here on the yes. landing page, you know, from that. So, uh, and, and, and so f- for folks that may be having a hard time, uh, reading that it says under the seeming disorder of the old city, where Ever the old city is working successfully, it is a marvelous order for maintaining the safety of the streets and the freedom of the city. Brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. And, you know, Jane Jacobs wasn't one to really discuss cycling to any extent um, right? yeah. in, in, her, in her books and in her work. But, uh, but what I loved, uh, love about this quote is, uh, you know, so much of, of Dutch cycling, especially in Amsterdam, is seen as chaotic and, in, and disorderly. Um, and, you know, even, uh, even local politicians here will look at, uh, you know, bicycles parked on the sidewalk and say, what a mess we have, what a problem this is. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, with this quote, we can see what, you know, what a beautiful problem it is. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, and it also brings up another aspect of, of how profound it is the statement that, you know, bikes are not motor vehicles, bikes are not cars. And yeah. the, the fact that you can have, you know, entire swarms of people getting around on bikes and, and integrating with people who are walking at the same time and, um, and that, that chaos, that sense of chaos, um, there can be some order that comes from that because yeah. you're simply moving at more closely to human speed. You can make eye contact. There's slight little, yes. you know, body language movements that are, that are, you know, part of the thing. And I know in the first episode, uh, you know, in season one, you and I talked about this one intersection where, uh, the city of Amsterdam removed all control devices and basically turned yeah. that intersection, a very, very busy intersection into quote unquote, a f- free for all. And guess what? Mm-hmm. It works. And the reason it works is because everybody was moving closer to human speeds. Sure. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, it is. And that, that sort of the embodied, uh, the embodied nature of cycling is something yeah. that, uh, I think is undervalued, uh, generally in transport engineering and traffic planning. Right. Um, you know, this, this very sort of, uh, uh, it, the experience, the individual experience, but also the collective and social experience that you have on the bicycle, um, it, you know, is something that is very difficult to, uh, plug into any, you know, traffic engineering algorithm. Um, and that also extends to the public space as well. Right. I mean, when we're, um, one of my favorite examples here is the, the Rijksmuseum. Right. where there's this beautiful tunnel uh, for, for bicyclists, but also for people walking to walk through the Rijksmuseum tunnel. And it's this, it's this sort of incredible um, museum experience where, you know, you have these, these 18th century, you know, sort of cathedral ceilings and this glass wall that you can look into the museum. Uh, and it's one of these experiences that, uh, that people go out of their way on their regular commute to, to experience. And in fact, that, that goes against all principles of, you know, of traffic engineering, which, which says that, you know, time, uh, that, that travel is a utility and time needs to be minimized. Um, and so how do we bring that in? How do we, you know, bring experiences like that, uh, into our daily routes and how can we sort of, you know, how can we spontaneously plan uh, for, for to encourage this type of, of experience? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to actually pull up so that uh, the, the audience can get a visual of 
what you're talking about there with the uh, the Rijks Museum. It's it's actually, uh, I believe it's it's queued up here um, right in this first segment. So let's hit play on this and and give this a watch. This is also from that 2019 trip. Okay. Oh, that's my neighborhood right there. <laughs> This is Amsterdam, though, and this has uh, some footage of that, the Rijksmuseum. That's my neighborhood. And so this is it. This is, we're going to, it's going to pan back around and you'll see, uh, you know, a, tw a, you know, a gal, probably she's like 12 or 13. She's going to ride right up towards the Rijksmuseum and then through that tunnel. And that tunnel has quite a bit of history to it too, because, um, the, yeah. the, the museum itself wanted to, to do away with having cycles go through there. Uh, mm -hmm. All different stakeholders were fighting and pushing and jostling and everything. But really, it was the community and the, uh, the cycling federation that, you know, kind of stood up and said, no, we, this, is, this is critical. This is not only pleasurable, <laughs> but it's also a critical connector uh, to get yeah. into that other side because that it's such a huge museum. It is a barrier. So it pretty, is. Well, yeah. and museum, museum plane, the, the sort of grassy area that's right outside of, uh, sort of connecting all these different museums is also a very historical place for demonstration and, uh, sort of civil disobedience. Uh, but places where it's an official place where people can gather, so I think that also uh, was a main argument for allowing the tunnel to remain open to the public uh, because it's a huge connector into the city center where obviously there's businesses and cultural, other cultural institutions. It's very valuable to have that um, conduit you know, yeah. towards, the, towards the center of the city. Yeah, good yeah. stuff, good stuff. Well, we're going to bring this to a close with having you tell us uh, some of the exciting things that you're starting to work on, uh, you know, going to, uh, forward into the future. I know that there's a, a new master's program that's coming together. Yeah. Uh, what else is on, on the works? Or, or tell us a little bit more about that, too. Sure. Um, well, I think, f uh, so first of all, we, uh, we've launched, um, a specialty track, what it's called on the platform Coursera, which is a online course platform that's pretty well known. All the major universities in the world are on it. Uh, and I think two, three years ago, we started our first online course called Unraveling the Cycling City. Uh, and we've now gained, um, I think about 10,000 students in that course. Uh, and then we've, uh, we've added, uh, three additional courses, um, uh, not, no, not only around cycling, but uh, one is called Alternative Mobility Narratives. Uh, another one is called Reclaiming Your Streets with sort of guerrilla urbanism. Uh, and then the final one is Getting Smart About Smart Cycling Futures. And uh, so together, these courses create a specialty on Coursera, um, which, is, which is sort of on its way to learn more like an online master's program for cycling. And so all together we have, uh, about 13,000 students with these, these four courses. So it's pretty exciting, uh, the way that, you know, the digital space, uh, and blended learning techniques are, are allowing for, you know, a whole group, a whole segment of the, of the global population to, to experience, uh, and learn, um, about, uh, about bicycling. Uh, but then, yes, and by, on a and more... By the way, I, and by the way, I was one of the graduates of that first uh, cohort or one of the first co cohorts. So, yeah, it was, it, was good, it was good fun and it was fun to, to, to hang out and, you know, and interact with the, the, the other cohort uh, around the world yes. and be able to see, yes. you know, all the, 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 the online videos, uh, you know, with George, with you, with Marco. Yeah. So it was all good stuff. Yeah. Now, there's also yeah. a Masters of Cycling uh, sort of mashed together between three different universities. What's that all about? Yes. Yeah. So the university, technical university Wuppertal in Germany, 
um, and uh, Lund University and the University of Amsterdam, we are combining forces to create a two-year master's program on cycling. Uh, and so each of the universities sort of brings its own strength, um, the technical university offering more technical engineering, um, University of Amsterdam, uh, this is it's actually where the, the program starts and is in Amsterdam, providing a sort of backdrop of urban planning, but also um, social um, uh, sort of transitions, uh, sustainability, um, and the social sciences. And then Lund um, offering um, also hands-on um, cycling um, technical um, yeah, technical science as well. Um, and so the, the aim is our first cohort to be, uh, to be up and running, um, as of 2023. So we're, we're putting together, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of different wheels working to make this administration, uh, administratively happen, bureaucratically happen. Um, joint programs are, are difficult to create and fund, but we're sort of embarking on that and and seeing uh, seeing what comes of it. Now, is this uh, going to be an in person program, or is this also going to be an online? Yes. Oh, so no, it's an it'll in-person. be in person in person traveling program. So the Fantastic. cohort okay. starts in Amsterdam, uh, goes to Lund, ends in Wuppertal. Um, in or, fact, uh, yeah. and so Lund is just up the road from uh, uh, Malmo there in yes. Sweden. Yeah. And, yes, and where is they have Wuppertal? a tight, tight connection. Yes. Uh, Wuppertal is in the, the north, um, uh, yeah, north of Germany, okay. northeast of Germany. Um, and uh, the Wuppertal Inst- Institute is, is highly regarded in, uh, in a lot of technical scientific fields. So um, yeah. it also has great, yeah, and it has its first bicycle professor as well, ah, okay. uh, Heather Katz. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the Germany is really steaming ahead, actually, in the, in the academic sense, um, beyond the Netherlands, which still doesn't have any, you know, bicycle professors officially. Mm-hmm. Um, the, that Germany has established, I think, six bicycle professors at, at all their major universities. Yeah. So, um, so it's it's a very interesting push, and it's something that uh, I hope the Netherlands will um, will also. Uh, yeah, one up at some point. We'll right, see. Right. Well, and I don't know if this is still the case in Germany, but uh, back in 2015, when I spent a, a good couple weeks in in Germany, traveling around, uh, documenting the various cities, uh, many of the universities there are really encouraging people to come in from uh, from other countries, and oh, yeah. uh, they essentially waive any <laughs> any tuition fees. So if you're looking at getting a master's, yeah. uh, you know, certainly some of these institutions that are in Germany should. Be seriously considered. So to close us out, why don't you talk a little bit about the uh, Copenhagen and Amsterdam speed reduction policies and low emissions zones that uh, are, are coming together? Yeah, yeah just very briefly, because um, I do have to have to run. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's some there's some definitely new policies um, with uh, in the city of Amsterdam um, in 2021 at the end of 2021. Uh, the city is starting to implement, uh, starting, they're starting to take away 50 kilometer an hour uh, roads and 30 kilometer an hour is the, the new norm across the whole city. Um, and uh, this has several implications on cycling, uh, which is very interesting to, to sort of analyze for the future as well, uh, how it will impact um, cycling. Um so, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of taking away these 50 kilometer roads and in, in its place, uh, implementing a lot of the, the feet strats, so the bicycle streets that are, you know, wider for cyclists and where, um, car drivers have to take a, a sort of back seat, um, right. to cyclists and the same in, in Copenhagen, um, they're working on, uh, implementing a 30 kilometer an hour policy as well. Um, and, uh, and also really interesting public space, uh, plans where, uh, Copenhagen, I, we just learned at the, at the general assembly and handshake that Copenhagen is initiating a, um, a, a traffic plan, but it's called public space and traffic. And it's purposely has public space uh, at the beginning because traffic co- should come secondary right. to public space. Uh, and so as a part of that, there's a whole bunch of new low emission zones, 
Uh, of course, electrification is a big part of it, but also just enhancing public space and making more uh, making more room for cyclists and bicycle parking and other types of an- amenities. Yeah. So it is. It's really exciting to. It's just a very exciting space to be in right now with a lot of changes and uh, a lot of ambition. Uh, and so we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. Well, and bottom line is streets are our largest uh, public space that we have out in the public yes. realm. And, yeah. uh, and hashtag streets are for people. <laughs> so yeah, there you yeah, go. Streets are for hey, people. Yeah. Meredith, thank you so very much for joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such a pleasure. I can't wait to yeah, actually see you. you in person once again when, when travel allows. And uh, I know you need to run, get back uh, to your family yes. because it's in the evening at, right now for you. Uh, again, it's thank cool you so much. Time. Yeah, thank you, John. I really appreciate it. And it's always fun to catch up and uh, and see a, an image or video from from a couple of years ago and think, oh, wow, I think I've updated my uh, updated my beliefs on that or or. Yeah, you know, it's just that that constant reminder of uh, of that we are learning as well. It's yes. great. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yay. OK. OK. Get out of here. <laughs> thank you. OK, bye bye. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend, and leave a comment down below. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, Just click on that button down below, and don't forget to ring the bell right next to the button for notifications. Also, please allow me a moment to mention there are two additional ways that you can help support my efforts. The first is to head over to my Active Town store where you can purchase some fun Streets Are For People swag. And the second is to become a patron on my Patreon account by making a modest monthly contribution that fits into your budget. It may not seem like much, but buying an item or two at the store and or becoming a patron really does help to keep the momentum of my Active Towns channel and my culture of activity movement rolling. Well, that's all for this week's episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.